And as they dismiss, I invite you to turn uh, in your copy of the scriptures to Luke chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 31 to 44 this morning. Please follow along with me as I read the holy word of God. This is the word of God. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went into every place in the surrounding region. And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Let us pray. O most gracious God and loving Father, you who feeds all creatures living by your divine providence, we ask you, Sanctify your word to us this morning. Give your word the virtue to nourish our hearts, our minds, and our bodies, that we may remember that we do not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. May we walk as those who believe the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. So mankind is a fearful bunch. We all fear something different. Some are scared of spiders. Some are scared of bees. You might be scared of heights. You may be scared of public speaking. And if I asked you to come up here and preach, you would probably be filled with terror. I know I am. But all of these fears are minor in the grand scheme of it all. And although we may feel like at times in our life those fears are quite major, but all of us have the same five greatest fears. Whether we think we do or we acknowledge that we do, the reality is all of us in this room have the same five greatest fears. And they're sin, demonic activity, disease, natural calamity, and the greatest fear of all, death. And what's amazing and and absolutely wonderful is that Jesus addresses our five greatest fears very quickly in his ministry. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus addresses all five of our fears in the first four chapters. Here in in the Gospel of Luke, we read that he defeats all five of our greatest fears before the end of chapter eight. But remember, He doesn't start his ministry until chapter 4. And so in the first four chapters of Mark, and in three and a half chapters of Luke, Jesus reveals to us that he is greater than all five of our greatest fears. But how does he do this? Well, we see sin as the temptation in the wilderness in Luke chapter 4. 
with demonic activity. We see the healing of a man with an unclean demon here also this morning in Luke chapter 4. We see that he conquers disease here in chapter 4 with Simon's mother-in-law. We see that he conquers natural calamity by calming a storm in Luke 8. And we see that he conquers death by raising a widow's son in chapter 7 of Luke. How does Jesus address each of our greatest fears? With preaching. What does he do for sin? Well, he rebukes Satan with the word of God. How does he handle demons? He rebukes them and they're silent and they come out. How does he handle disease? He rebukes the fever and the person is healed. How does he handle natural calamity? He rebukes the wind and the waves and they're calm. How does he handle death? He rebukes death itself and the widow's son is risen. Notice how Jesus overcomes all of our fears with words. Jesus rebukes each of our fears with only words, words, and he overcomes and conquers each of them. And it's the same word that created the universe, and it will be the same word that will be present at the great white throne of judgment at the end of all things. And it's that word that finds its fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. You can go through the gospel of Mark and you can do the same thing. You can find in those first four chapters that Jesus defeats those five great fears simply by the power and authority of his words. And I reference the gospel of Mark because I think one thing that is sorely lacking in Christian education and, and teaching and preaching throughout the country and probably throughout the world is what we call in, in theology the harmony of the gospels. And what, who do you think is the best commentator on the book of Luke? Well, the answer is Matthew, Mark, and John. Who's the best commentator on Mark? Well, it's Matthew, Luke, and John. You guys get the point. To, to help us understand the Gospels, you have to read all of them to help understand the passage. And this morning is a perfect example. So Luke 4, 31 to 38, the, the passage we're going to look at today is found in Mark chapter 1, 21 to 39. The exact passage. Almost word for word. There's differences in details because Mark gives us other details that Luke doesn't, and Luke gives us details that Mark doesn't. But what together they do is they give us a better picture of what is actually happening. And so in our passage this morning, we will be focusing in on two of our greatest fears, demonic activity and disease. And our passage is naturally divided into three parts, and so my message is going to have 15 points. Just kidding. I'm a genius, and I went with three points, with three sections. I know, I'm, a, I'm, so, I'm so smart. In the first section, we're going to see that Jesus' preaching has authority over the spiritual realm. In the second section, we're going to see that his preaching has the authority over the physical realm. And lastly, we're going to see that uh, Jesus' purpose for the incarnation, why did he come? And that purpose is to preach but specifically that his preaching has the authority to grant life. And so before we really get into it, I want to give you the main point for this morning. And the main point this morning is that there is power and authority in the true preaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Let me say it again. There is power and authority in the true preaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God. And so let's unpack that this morning. So he went down to Capernaum. Now, in the previous passage, Jesus was in Nazareth. And here Luke tells us that Jesus goes down to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was about 45 miles from Nazareth. And it's interesting that he says he went down to Capernaum because it is from Nazareth to Capernaum straight downhill all the way. Capernaum was a city on the northwest part of the Sea of Galilee. And it was where Jesus had his ministry headquarters on this earth. So he says, on the Sabbath, Luke says on the Sabbath. Now, he re Luke records for us in the Gospel of Luke at least five times where Jesus performs a miracle on the Sabbath. That is supposed to be a day set aside for rest and worship. And Jesus, throughout his ministry, had a special concern for proper Sabbath observations. And on many occasions, he debates the religious leaders over what is proper and what is improper regarding the Sabbath. 
Now Luke's mention of it here is a reference to Isaiah 58 and Jesus' opposition to the legalistic views that were practiced and advocated by the religious leaders. See, Jesus should not be healing anyone on the Sabbath according to these religious leaders. And yet, we read that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, and therefore Jesus is teaching us what is proper on the Sabbath, and in our context this morning, the Lord's Day, because the Sabbath was Saturday, but our Lord was risen on Sunday, and so we rest and we worship on Sunday, the Lord's Day. And so we read here that Jesus was in the synagogue teaching. And Sabbath teachings were always conducted in the synagogue, just like we are here this morning on Sunday morning, gathered at his church to hear the preaching of God's word. It's the same principle. And so the crowd listening was astonished and amazed at Jesus' teaching. And Luke, actually, along with Mark, they tell us why. Jesus taught as one who possessed authority. And Mark actually includes, this is why you've got to read both, Mark includes in his Gospels, he says that Jesus taught as one who possessed authority and not as the scribes. See, Jesus' preaching was different than the regular preaching that they were hearing, and it was because Jesus taught as one who had authority. See, in Jesus' preaching, there was truth. There was, there's organization to his preaching because the scribes and Pharisees, they were actually known to just ramble on and on about nothing. Jesus addressed matters of significance. He addressed life, death, eternity, and so on. And, and Jesus spoke in parables and these brilliant illustrations that, that captivated hearts and minds. He preached with love towards those who were listening. And he preached in power and authority. But what does it mean that Jesus preached with power and authority? Well, simply, it means that Jesus' message was that he came to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. And we're going to look in a moment at the, the message itself when we get to that section. But the message itself came directly from the very heart and mind of God. We read that in John eight twenty six, And thereby, his message that came from the, the heart and mind of God came from his inner being because Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. And it also came through the breathed out word of God, which is inspired and directed by the Holy Spirit. And so what we're actually seeing is the authority of Jesus' preaching had the triune God of Scripture as its foundation. And there's no higher authority in both the spiritual and the physical realms than God himself. The religious leaders of the day were constantly preaching from fallible sources themselves. The religious leaders were trying to draw water from broken cisterns. Yet Jesus drew water from himself, the fountain of living water. Now in the synagogue, there was a man who had a demon. Now, this is a topic that is foreign to most people. We, we naturally do not think in terms of demon possession. But what is, and I think more importantly, what is not demon possession? Well, what it is not, let's start with that. So demon possession is not that all physical illness and abnormalities are a result of a demon. In all four Gospels and in the book of Acts, the scripture writers are careful to distinguish between diseases that are caused by demons and diseases that are not caused by demons. Demon possession is not simply another term for insanity. Demon possession is not simply another term for multiple personality disorder. But what is demon possession is that demon possession describes a condition in which a distinct an evil personality that is foreign to the person that's being possessed has taken control of that individual. And the demon speaks through the mouth of that individual. What demon possession is, is demons are agents of Satan. And Jesus came to this earth in order to crush the power of Satan. And Jesus teaches actually in a parable where the parable about the binding of the strong man and he, he, Jesus, is the one that binds the strong man, Satan. 
He does it by uh, defeating him in the desert wilderness at his temptation. He defeats it on numerous occasions by casting out demons. And he ultimately does it upon the cross. See, this binding of Satan on earth, it actually points forward to when Jesus will ultimately, in totality, defeat Satan once and for all at his second coming. And see, in theology, we call this the already, not yet. Jesus has already defeated Satan at his death and resurrection, but he will defeat him completely at his return. And so we find this demon-possessed man in the synagogue, and he cries out in a loud voice. He interrupts Jesus' preaching. He says, ha, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Notice the demon's immediate surrender. There's no debate. There's no battle. There's no war of words between Jesus and the demon. Rather, there is simply submission. Jesus, the incarnate one, has come from heaven to earth to end Satan's power over sin, death, and hell. And here in this passage, we are beginning to see the fulfillment of that promise. It is the same Jesus that came to seek and save the lost that also came to destroy the demons and his master. And what's more, the demons know it. James 2.19 says, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Here in Luke 4, we are seeing James 2.19 playing out right before our eyes. The demon that is in the man believes that God is one. And at this very moment, that demon is looking eye to eye at Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. And he shudders. And let me press in on that for a moment. When you think about Jesus and who he truly is, he is very God of very God. And if there's never been any sense of fear because of who Jesus truly is, if you've never had a little slice of fear thinking about Jesus, you've missed it. Yes, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we do have nothing to fear because in Jesus Christ, those in Christ have life, hope, and peace with God. And praise God and thank God for that. But don't forget Jesus' other role, judge. And he is the one that will bring the full wrath and justice of God to the ungodly at the end of 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 times. Let that sink in. This is who we're dealing with. So when the demon cries out, I know who you are, he's not lying. The demon has better theology than all of us. And yet he will never taste salvation. And what we can learn from this demon is that Jesus Christ is divine. And there's many people in this world today that want to think about Jesus as not being divine. And there are heresies upon heresies out there that will tell you that Jesus is not divine. But those who deny Jesus' divinity show that they are dumber than demons. And what do you believe today? Do you believe that Jesus is the Holy One of God, the divine Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the suffering servant, the one who crushes the head of the serpent, the Alpha, the Omega? But Jesus gives no acknowledgement of the demon. And furthermore, the demon has no right to interrupt our Lord's teaching. And so Jesus quickly and sternly rebukes the demon. Be quiet. And come out of him. Immediately, the demon obeys. In his leaving, he shrieks wildly. He throws the man down in front of the crowd. He convulses the man. But Luke, being the doctor that he is, he mentions that the man received no injuries as a result of the demon's exit. The demon was utterly defeated simply by Jesus' word. The same word that created the universe, that governs the spiritual, and as we're going to see in the moment, the physical realm, that same word immediately drives out that demon. And what's the result of this event? Well, Scripture tells us amazement, astonishment, wonder, awe. Not only were they amazed at his preaching, 
But now his preaching had evidences accompanying them. See, the miracles and the exorcisms, the healings, that wasn't the end goal. All of the wonders and miracles that Jesus did was to reveal to us who Jesus is. He is the God-man. And see, these events supported Jesus' preaching ministry, not the other way around. And see, we begin to understand why Jesus' fame spread so rapidly and powerfully and why people from all Judea, the entire, the entire nation, were traveling just to get a glimpse of this man. And so what are we to learn from this first section? Well, first, that amazement is not enough. Being amazed at who Jesus is, is not enough. But rather, it is genuine faith that is needed. Second, who's the better theologian? A demon or one who claims that Jesus is not divine? And three, let us not forget of Jesus' tender love in that first part. Wait, love. The man who was possessed. What love from Jesus to set that man free from demon possession? And so we see that Jesus' preaching has authority over the spiritual realm. And that leads us to the second section of our passage this morning. And there we're going to see that Jesus' preaching has authority over the physical realm as well. And so after casting out the demon from the man in the synagogue, Jesus leaves and goes to Simon Peter's house. Now Peter and Andrew, the both brothers and disciples of Jesus, they were from Capernaum. And so Jesus and his disciples, and, and surely the crowd as well, went over to Peter's house. They arrive, and they find that Peter's mother-in-law is ill with a high fever. It was common practice that older parents would live with their children in, those, in that culture. And so as they arrive, Peter and Andrew, they asked for Jesus to come to her aid. And Luke, the beloved physician, he understands medicine and the way that doctors are supposed to carry him themselves. He's a doctor. He gets it. And so here, Luke adds this very small line, and he stood over her. Now, some might pass by this too quickly, but what Luke is telling us is that Jesus placed himself in the position that a doctor would place themselves. Is Jesus a trained medical doctor like Luke? Well, no. Jesus was a carpenter in his humanity. But what is, what is Jesus doing at this very moment? Jesus is actually acting in his divinity. So look at that first opening section. The demon calls Jesus the Holy One of God. That's a divine title. And in a moment, we're going to see that the other demons are going to be crying out, you are the Son of God. Another divine title. So although failed by human flesh, we must never forget that Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity, God himself. And as God, he created mankind. And that's why one of Jesus's names is the great physician. See, Jesus didn't need to go to medical school in order to heal. He could heal because he was God who made Adam from the dust of the ground and took a rib from Adam to make Eve. Do we really think that Jesus needed a medical degree to be able to heal somebody? And so Jesus, assuming the position of doctor, stood over her, and he rebuked the fever. And what is striking is the lack of information given about this healing. We're not given who was in the room. We're not given what the room looked like. We're not even given the exact words that Jesus said. Nothing. In fact, in the Greek, it's only six words. And it literally is translated, if you want to do it woodenly, it says, he rebuked the fever and it left her. That's it. That's the only information we get. But that's on purpose. Because this miracle was instantaneous. Jesus commanded it to leave, and it was gone. In such few words, Jesus healed her. No medicine, no pills, no treatment, no physical therapy, no chicken noodle soup. Simply, Jesus commanded. 
And the fact that we are given so little information is on purpose. See, Luke wanted us to understand that those who witnessed this healing were utterly overwhelmed by Jesus' majesty and his greatness. See, we, we, uh, the, notice, notice the effects of this healing. See, the, the effects were not, they were not only sudden, but they were complete. See, we've all felt the effects of a debilitating fever, flushed cheeks, dry, scratchy throat, burning hot skin, profuse sweating, violent shivering. We're all having nightmares right now. This was the state of Peter's mother-in-law. And yet, the moment that Jesus rebuked the fever, all of her strength returned in an instant. She didn't say, oh, I feel better, but I'm still a little tired. Let me, let me rest a little bit and regain my strength. No, in a moment, she went from sick and dying to healthy and alive, full of strength. Luke adds the, that the moment the fever was rebuked, she got up and immediately began to serve them like the good hostess that she is. But that's not the end of the story, and that's not the end of Jesus' healing on this day. The news of the demon-possessed man being cured, the, the news of Peter's mother-in-law being healed spread. And Scripture tells us that all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. See, the Gospel of Mark right here actually adds that the whole city together was gathered at the door. I don't know how big the city was, maybe 500, 600, maybe 1,000. How would you like 1,000 people at your front door? Everyone who had a friend or a relative with the disease brought them to Jesus. And Jesus healed them. But take note of what Luke tells us. It wasn't just fevers. It's not like he's the fever guy. Oh, he's got a fever, bring him to Jesus. No, no, no. Jesus healed various diseases. And here again, Luke, being the doctor that he is, helps to shed light on the situation that's unfolding. One commentator put it this way. He said, Luke pictures a procession of the sick being brought one by one to Jesus, who, paying due attention to and lovingly placing his hands on, each in turn healed them all. Are we starting to understand why the entire country followed him around? Jesus was like nothing they had ever seen, nor will they ever see again. But not only was he healing physical diseases and abnormalities, Jesus was also casting out demons. And Luke adds this, just like Matthew and Mark do in their Gospels, and just like before, with a word, Jesus casts out many demons. And notice what the demons are saying as they're being cast out. You are the Son of God. And so everything we said earlier about the demon-possessed man applies here. There was no fight, no battle, no argument. It was instant submission, instant surrender from the demon to the authority and power of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus forbids these demons from speaking, just like before. Jesus can hear them because Jesus is God. But he prevented them from speaking through the mouth of the person so that the physical realm could not hear. And in, in verse 40, 41, Luke actually gives us the reason why Jesus forbade the demons to speak. It was because, ready? They knew. They knew that he was the Christ. But why would Jesus command them not to speak? Well, I offer you three reasons this morning. The first the demons knew that Jesus was the Messiah. But if the people were to believe this and act upon it, they might start a movement to make Jesus the king. And of course, Jesus did not want this. Two, due to the expected opposition from Jesus' enemies, because he had a lot of them, any acknowledgement at this time of Jesus as the Messiah would probably have resulted in a quicker death for Jesus and therefore, and, and Jesus would not allow man to thwart God's timing. And three, during the days of Jesus' humiliation, that would be the days between his birth 
and his death on the cross. That's what we call in theology his, his humiliation. Any proclamation to the identity of Jesus as the Messiah would actually be in conflict with Mark chapter 9, verse 9, 30, and 31, where Jesus actually says there that they are not, this is to the disciples, they are not to speak that, about him being the Messiah until after he rises from the dead. And after he rose from the dead, we call that his exaltation. And it is at his resurrection that Jesus' witness as the Messiah is complete. And so we see through the healing of Peter's mother-in-law and the many people with various diseases that Jesus healed, uh, or that Jesus healed through the power and preaching through the gospel of the kingdom of God. He healed through words. And he has the authority to command the physical realm, and the physical realm must obey. And that leads us to our third point, that Jesus then leaves the house, and he heads to a desolate pit place, as was his custom. Uh, I believe uh, the other gospels say that when he goes off to a desolate place, he went off to pray. This, was his, this is what he did. And while he was out by himself, the people looked for him, and they were planning on preventing him from leaving. But Jesus had other plans. And let us be clear at this moment that Jesus in his earthly ministry was not going to let anyone, even the disciples, dictate where he should or should not go. Jesus was, on, was fulfilling the mission of God, and no man was going to prevent him from fulfilling every aspect of that mission. Jesus' message was not only for Capernaum, but it was for all. And so Jesus commands the spiritual realm, and it obeys. He commands the physical realm, and it obeys. And we've looked at his authority and where it comes from. But in our last section this morning, we get the purpose for why Jesus Christ came into this world in the first place. And Jesus himself says, I must preach the gospel of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. Jesus must preach. But the question is, what is the message that Jesus is preaching? And Jesus tells us that his message is the gospel of the kingdom of God. So let's break that down into its parts. First, the gospel, the good news. The gospel is that we are sinners, enemies of God. We all deserve wrath and justice from God. And yet, in the fullness of time, pouring out from the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, God sent his only son, Jesus, to be born of a virgin. This Jesus, he lived a perfect, sinless life, became the suffering servant of God, the lamb of God. He was betrayed, beaten, flogged, spit upon, mocked, condemned to death, death on a cross, place of cursedness and judgment. But that cross, the place of ultimate humiliation and shame, became the place of ultimate exaltation and glory. For Jesus Christ rose from the grave on the third day, full of life, power, and authority. And, after, and soon after his resurrection from the dead, he ascended on high to the right hand of the Father. And the Father has placed under his feet all of his enemies, and given him authority in heaven and on earth. We do not serve a dead Savior. We serve a risen and alive Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. If you've never responded to the call of Christ to surrender your life to him and enjoy peace with God, now's the time. Now's the time. We are not promised tomorrow, but you are promised to stand before Christ and give an account for your life. Do you want him to look at you with love and peace or to look at you with wrath and justice? And if you have responded to Christ and are living for him, in what ways is God wanting you to grow in your faith in Jesus Christ? That's the gospel. But what's the kingdom of God? 
Now, there have been books upon books written on this topic. And I think it boils down to four components. First, the kingdom of God is God's kingship, his rule, and his sovereignty. Second, the kingdom of God is complete salvation, spiritual and physical blessings, as we have seen in this passage. By the way, when we are risen with Christ at the end, are we only going to be spiritual or are we going to be spiritual and physical? The answer is both. We will be given glorified physical bodies. Why? Because Christ lives and reigns in a physical, spiritual body in heaven. Because he has it, we get it. That's awesome. The kingdom of God is the church, a community of believers whose hearts recognize God as king. Right now, and I mean right now, the body under the preaching and worshiping of the word is the kingdom of God. In this room, us together is the kingdom of God. That's why Sunday mornings are so important. You can't do this on a Tuesday night with three friends. It's the body of Christ coming together. Church is so important. The kingdom of God is also the redeemed universe. The new heaven, the new earth at the end of the age with all of its glory is also the kingdom of God. And these four things are relatable and they are inseparable. All of these proceed from the central idea that God is sovereign over all things, especially salvation. Jesus spoke of the work of salvation as the kingdom of God to tell us that our salvation is a supernatural character. It has a supernatural character. It has a supernatural origin, and it has a supernatural purpose. It all boils down to this, glory. God's sovereignty, our salvation, the church, the heavens, the new heavens, new earth, all of it should resound loud and clear for the glory of God. That was Jesus' purpose, the glory of God. And that returns us to our main point this morning, which is that there is power and authority in the true preaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God. The power and authority is not from the preacher. I have no power or authority of just because of who I am. Zilch, you shouldn't listen to me at all. The reason I preach is for the glory of God. The reason all of us should preach is for the glory of God. The reason you should listen to the preached word is because of the authority and the power of where it comes from. Not me. It comes from God. That's the power and authority of our message. That's the power and authority of Christ's message, the gospel of the kingdom of God. It comes from Jesus Christ, who's the author and the perfecter of our faith. And so as I bring this to a close, Jesus, the God-man, fully God, fully man, Jesus, in his humanity, relied on the Holy Spirit for his power and authority. But we can also say that Jesus in his divinity, the second person of the, of the Godhead, was never separated from communion with God the Father and the Holy Spirit throughout his entire ministry. And so the ministry of the word cannot be separated from the work of the Spirit. It is through the preached word of God that the Holy Spirit works to regenerate lost souls. That is why true, accurate, clear, compelling preaching is so important. Because it is the way that God determines to save sinners. Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. You can't save anybody by mowing their grass. It's a nice thing to do. It's a great thing to do. Do it for them. Serve them. You ain't saving anybody by it. You need to share the gospel. That's how people get saved. You want to see your friends and families and neighbors, they come to Christ, come to a saving knowledge and faith in Jesus Christ. Preach the word. All of us. The Puritan Richard Sibbs remarks, those that care not for the word are strangers to the spirit. For they that care not for the spirit never make a right use of the word. The word is nothing without the spirit and only animated and quickened by him. The spirit and the word are like the veins and arteries in the body that give life to the whole. And therefore, where the word is most revealed, there is most of the spirit. Does this mean that all of us should come up here and have our turn preaching? Well, no. The special office of pastor is not for everyone, but the general office of believer, 
is. If you call yourself a believer in Jesus Christ, you are called to the general office of believer. Therefore, you are called to share the gospel with everyone. Each and every single one of us are to preach the gospel and share Christ with our friends, family, co-workers, strangers, anybody. Preaching that is true to the gospel of the kingdom of God and powered by the spirit has the authority over the spiritual and physical realms to bring life to those who trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We can, all of us, and should, all of us, participate in proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God. Whether that's one-on-one discipleship where you have one person teaching Well, guess what? If you're teaching somebody the gospel, you're preaching to them. You're preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, whether it's small groups, Sunday schools, Bible studies, any places where the gospel of the kingdom of God is preached, that's where preaching takes place. The preaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God is, as Richard Sibbs comments, is nothing without the power of the Spirit, and it is the Holy Spirit who takes hearts of stone, dead men, and quickens their heart, turns it into flesh, and brings new life. Just like creation was entirely of God, did you need to accept creation for it to happen? That's a joke. No. Just like that, salvation is entirely up to God. Let us strive to preach the gospel wherever we go, to whomever will listen, and let it be true, accurate, loving, compelling, winsome, and clear so that God's word never returns void and we see a harvest. Jesus actually said that now is the time for harvest. Now. Let us act on our beliefs and be fishers of men and expect, expect harvest for the glory of God. For our prayer response this morning, we are going to be singing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And and this classic hymn uh, by Martin Luther speaks precisely to what we've been talking about this morning. Verse 3 of that hymn says, The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. One little word shall fell him. And as we sing this song, do not just go through the motions of singing. Don't just, no, 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 he's nice. No, 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 no. Meditate on these words. Jesus, with a word, conquers all. Let's pray. Lord, Lay whatever burden you will upon me. Only let your everlasting arms be under me. Strike, Lord, and do not spare me. I lay down in your will. I have learned to say amen to your amen. You have a greater interest in me than I have in myself, and therefore I give myself up to you. I am willing to be at your disposal, and I am ready to receive whatever impression you want to stamp upon me. Blessed Lord, again and again you have said to me, as once the king of Israel said to the king of Syria, Syria, I am yours and all that I have. I am yours. Your mercy is mine to pardon me. Your blood is mine to cleanse me. Your merits are mine to justify me. Your righteousness is mine to clothe me. Your spirit is mine to lead me. Your grace is mine to enrich me. And your glory is mine to reward me. Therefore, my soul cannot help but resign myself to you. Lord, here I am. Do with me as seems good in your own eyes. I know the best way to have my own will is to resign myself to your will and to say amen to your amen. In Jesus' name, the one who crushed the serpent's head and the Alpha and the Omega. Amen. If you have questions about what you've just heard, or if you want to know more about what it means to follow Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to check out our website, faithbfc.org. 
Uh, if you live in the, the Harleysville area and you're not part of a local church, we'd love to have you worship with us here at Faith. I look forward to meeting with you personally. Um, but whether you live here or, or somewhere else, the important thing is to get plugged into a local church where you can grow uh, in your walk with Jesus Christ and help others grow as you serve Him.